Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Dwayne Taves visits with Casey Olson about a noxious weed and how burning is becoming a tool to fight it. Then enjoy this week's Kansas soybean update. Next, Dwayne Taves talks with Don Close from Rabobank about changes in the market and future protein trends. Then it's this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update and we'll end with Plain Talk featuring Kyla Dwayne. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first, Dwayne and KC Olson talk about burning as a method of reducing noxious weeds. Dwayne Taves joining you once again here on Ag AM in Kansas and an opportunity to catch up with Casey Olson uh, talking about uh, some of the issues for native grass pastures in the state. Uh, some invasive species, Casey, have become uh, a bigger issue and producers are looking at, at new ways to try and address that. I know you've done some research and have a number of years of data now uh, at a pretty interesting concept. Yes, sir. Um, we're really interested in mitigating Cerisia lespidiza for the ranchers of this state. Right now, the only tool available to us is uh, herbicide at a cost of approximately $18 an acre. With some of our recent data collection, we've discovered that fire, prescribed fire during the months of August or September, will uh, do a better job at cleaning up the Cerisia lespidiza at just a fraction of the cost. Uh, some of our clients that uh, have Cerisia lespidiza mitigation bills that run to five and six figures have been the earliest ones to buy in. Um, but we're, we're seeing significant acreage in the state that, that is being burned about this time of the year. It's certainly a, a different uh, atmosphere or climate when you think about a summer burn. I'm sure there's some apprehension on a lot of folks' part uh, that, uh, that have concern about what will the effect on the grass be. Well, the, uh, the effects on the grass have actually been uniformly positive. Uh, we haven't uh, moved our, our uh, C4 uh, tall grass species, uh, one iota, with applying fire for four consecutive years at this time. We've actually stimulated the wildflower and the legume community, bringing some of those minor plant components back that have major influences on prairie health. Talk a little bit about uh, the importance or why we're looking at that, uh, what Cerisia is actually doing to our native glands. Uh, it's a question of what can't Cerisia do. It is the plutonium of the plant community. It's canopy dominant, it's allelopathic, it's tremendously uh, reproductive. Uh, one plant producing, or one stem rather, producing over 800 seeds per year, uh, and it's also a perennial. So it can reproduce off of its own rootstock. The, uh, the approach to control has to have two prongs, okay? It has to control seed-based reproduction and it has to control propagation from uh, an existing plant base. Fire will do both of those things. And as, at the right time, of course, and as Cerisi is progressively removed from the ecosystem, the void, okay, that's left behind is being filled by native plants that are quite desirable. And, and coincidentally, uh, with uh, August and September prescribed burns, we're also getting excellent control of ironweed and western ragweed, one of which, the latter of which, is a pretty potent allergen for many of your listeners. We think about uh, the change in philosophy and mindset. We've been used to spring pasture burning uh, in terms of uh, accelerating growth of those uh, C4 plants, but uh, in terms of control, it looks like we have got to get later into the growing season. Then. Well, there's a there's a sure way to get into a jam in the range management realm, and that's do the same thing the same way every year. Um, it is it can be very helpful, very healthy to switch things up for a period of time, especially when you've got a, a, a targeted issue uh, like Cerisia lespidiza. One of the questions that we consistently get, because up to this point our our data has been plant based only, is what is that going to do to the performance of yearling cattle that come here to the Flint Hills and, and graze? And we're, we're standing in a location that's immediately in front of a, a, a production scale research project that was just started uh, this summer. Uh, we will compare uh, August burning with October burning with April burning on at least six pastures per treatment um, with livestock performance as a primary metric. We will know the answer to this question progressively over the next seven years. 
Our thanks to Casey Olson. Joining us here on Ag AM in Kansas, Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Are your cows practical or profitable? If you want them to be both, come to the Dale Banks Angus Bull Sale Saturday, November 17th near Eureka, Kansas. Selling 140 yearling and coming two-year-olds who have spent their days on the rugged pastures of the Flint Hills. For 114 years, the Perriers have been focused on providing hard-working, balanced trait bulls for progressive cattlemen nationwide. Make plans to join us November 17th or pre-register to bid online. For more information and to view our catalog, visit www.dalebanks.com. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Jennifer Greenstein is joining us. She serves as the co-chair of the Next Generation Scientist for a Biodiesel Program, which is managed by the National Biodiesel Board. And Jennifer, what is the objective of this program? The objective of the Next Generation Scientist for Biodiesel Program is to foster relationships between students and professionals that work in the biodiesel field. So we focus a lot on collaboration, networking, and career development. Jennifer, you're a doctoral candidate at North Carolina State University in plant and microbiology, and your research on that specifically is focused on biodiesel. I'm a PhD student at NC State University, and I began this program actually working in enzymatic biodiesel, so I was working on an alternative approach to produce biodiesel. And I saw that using immobilized enzymes worked a lot better for us than using soluble enzymes. So I thought it'd be really cool if I took that enzyme and used it to another piece that would enable immobilization in one easy step. So that would provide an alternative catalyst for biodiesel production. Why is it important to have a cooperation like this between universities and the biodiesel industry? It's very important for an organization like this to exist because students can become very isolated in the academic world and never talk to professionals. So it's really good for students to see what kind of jobs are out there, to meet people, hear what they have to say, see what types of things the industry is interested in. And it's also uh, great for people in industry to meet students so they can see all the types of research that they're doing. And if there are students who have an interest in joining the Next Generation Scientist for Biodiesel Program, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, For students to join the Next Generation Scientist for Biodiesel Program, just visit biodieselsustainability.com and go over to the student tab and the application is right there. It is free and just takes minutes to join. And then you receive all sorts of updates and emails and information about webinars and invite to apply to a travel scholarship for the conference. All right, Jennifer, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. That is Jennifer Greenstein, who serves as the co-chair of the Next Generation Scientist for Biodiesel Program, which is managed by the National Biodiesel Board. She joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more with Dwayne Tates and Don Close. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. All over the country, more and more communities are making the change to biodiesel made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans while adding billions to our national economy. 
Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now we learned about the Robo Bank and market trends with Dwayne Tapes and Don Close. Dwayne Tames joining you once again here on Ag AM in Kansas and an opportunity to catch up with Don Close with Robobank. And Don, we think about uh, the beef industry and changes. One thing's for certain, uh, like in many industries, uh, change and adapti adaptability is, is going to be key for producers as we go forward. I think you're absolutely correct. And, I, you know, if I look back over the 40-plus uh, years that I've, I've been in, in the business, I cannot think of a time that the, there's more, so many moving pieces in today's market that that's, that makes it more difficult. The other thing going on, particularly right now, you've got all of these tariff trade issues going on. They're just, I've never seen a time, there's just so much noise in the market. And at the end of the day, I really don't think it's much more than that, but it just clutters the field as we try to decipher and work through these issues. As we look to the next uh, three to five years uh, down the road, uh, focus on consumer uh, has certainly been a bigger uh, presence within industry circles, and it provides some interesting opportunities. I think there's some incredible opportunities, and as we talked this morning, we're 2018, we, we know that the, the millennial population has outnumbered baby boomers for a number of years, but 2018 is the year that the, uh, the baton will pass, that the uh, millennials will have uh, more spending power than the boomers. So it, I don't know that that means radical changes, but just as we, we see the, the concerns of interest of those young, younger consumers being a bigger driver in the marketplace. Uh, but I also see the really good opportunities, certainly in the last several years with the uh, growing economy uh, and, and the demand that has created for beef has been like nothing I've ever seen before. You talk about uh, always concerned about changes. There's other segments of the food chain delivery system that are going to see even bigger changes than those who are providing the food at the base source. I believe that's true, and, and, and the area where I would focus that uh, transition, um, A, the, uh, the conven conventional food manufacturer uh, and how that the, their change up in market share, the change we're seeing with the uh, growth in store brands at the expense of a lot of traditional uh, center aisle uh, products, uh, I think that the sensitivity that indust both the cattle industry and beef processors, we have to, will have to be more sensitive to what are the concerns and requests of that consumer and the and the buying power that they drive. And then finally, I think if we see the transition from conventional brick and mortar stores to online shopping, that the conventional brick and mortar stores will face either radical changes in their business model or B, will become less and less of an influence in the marketplace. Talk a little bit about uh, the North American beef market. You referenced that Mexico is going to become a bigger player in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. But not only domestically do we not necessarily want to be the low-cost uh, protein choice, but the high-quality choice. I, 
clearly, if you take the uh, the twenty percent increase in the percentage of choice and prime cattle that uh, we we produce on average today uh, over where we were at uh, in the late seventies, early eighties, um, you take uh, the the improvement in, in cattle quality both with the Mexican incorporation of Mexico into that mix, but uh, the, the 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 quality of product Canada produces. North America, I like to use the analogy, is going is in position to be the BMW Mercedes Mercedes Benz dealer to the world on beef quality. Um, I think we've got an emerging markets uh, with India and the production of car beef and being the the low cost of low cost producers. So if you take that other eight to ten uh, beef exporting countries. Does that leave them in a position to try to be the the ultimate low cost producer and compete on that end, or do they they take make the considerations changes that they would have to make to compete on beef quality? And I think the other beef producing countries are just constantly going to be in a state of of tug of which market do they try to focus on? All right, thanks to Don Close joining us here on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update. I had this horse, it was a good horse, except when the wind was blowing above 30 mile an hour. Wind was blowing about 35, 40, and I saddled him up, rode him out to the end of the lane, and I thought, well, he's doing pretty good. And about six jumps later, I was laying on the ground and thinking, boy, my shoulder sure hurt. I kept waiting and it, it didn't get better. And so I went to an orthopedic surgeon and that showed that I had torn rotator cuff. And said, well, I have to do surgery. And I, I farm and ranch by myself. It's not gonna work out very well. I'd been sleeping in my recliner for about two and a half years because it hurt too much to sleep in bed on my side. And I'd heard about Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center on the radio. And gotten down there at eight o'clock in the morning and by 11.30, the procedure was all over. They just took some fat out of my side here and spun that down for about 45 minutes and then injected it in my shoulders and I was on my way. It's something you don't hear about but I thought it was worth a try and, and I'm really pleased. It's, it's really worked out well for me. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau update. Uh, my name is Stephanie Eckroat and I'm from Ellis County Farm Bureau. I'm an Ellis County Farm Bureau member. I'm also a county coordinator for both Ellis and Trigo County. I also work with the Collegiate Farm Bureau group out of Fort Hayes State University. I'm also associated with a commodity group here in Kansas. I work with the Kansas Dairy Commission, Kansas Dairy Association. Uh, my husband and I live on a uh, farm outside of Hayes where we stable horses um, and provide an agritourism opportunity for people passing through Kansas. I guess my favorite part of being part of Farm Bureau is working with the collegiate kids. So Day of the State House is one of my favorite events. Um, I love to bring the students up and give them the opportunity to understand where um, you know democracy starts, to see the Capitol, to meet um, the representatives. Um, it's been very rewarding to get to come and show the students that. Um, I myself didn't know a lot about policy or um, anything that goes into the electoral process and the, and the things that go on in Topeka until I, st until I started working with Farm Bureau. And now I understand the importance of it. And so I love to share that day with the students. We try to bring up several students um, so they can have the opportunity to um, understand how their government works. I think it's super important for them to, to get those chances. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. Tarwater Farm and Home has been family owned and operated since its beginning in 1978. What you need for farm and agriculture, lawn and garden, clothing and footwear, and so much more. You'll be surprised at what you'll find in this huge store. They have what you need and lots of it. So come take a look. You'll discover that customer service is first and foremost 
always has been with the Tar Waters. Tar Water Farm and Home, 4107 North Topeka Boulevard. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at kfrm.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk. With the man who was going to wear his camouflage shirt today, but he couldn't find it, Dwayne Taves. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah. You're always worried when I come up with those, don't you? Yeah, it makes me nervous. It, it when makes you, start you really that. nervous. It's like just how far under the bus is he every throw once me in a today? while? You kind of sometimes they hurt because they're true. Hey, every once in a while, you little a little like, touchy, a little it's sensitive. Like, it's like well, okay, from now on, I you can you can take digs at me. If they ever did outtakes of this program, uh-huh. which I know they could because we've had plenty, but they've never actually published or shown them on TV, right? Hope they don't, but we do have a lot of fun. You know, I think it was before your time, we had a young man working here in the summer, and yeah. I used to have a bad uh, habit of not erasing uh, when I would do a cut, an ad or whatever, and it wasn't any good, and I'd go and make some silly sound, right. and then I wasn't good about erasing that. Leaving well, he it. found those, yeah. and he made Compiled a, a little... He made a little thing that he played at the Christmas party. Oh. Yeah. Um, How long he doesn't was work he for us anymore. <laughs> he doesn't work for That's us anymore. That's a great anymore. idea. Everybody if thought it was mind. hilarious, yeah. except me. Yeah. But I have since then been a lot more careful about leaving things about up on the computers here. Up. That is the interesting part about the office here. I mean, we share a lot of computers, and there's opportunity for that to happen. So, your fact or fiction question of the day, Kyle Bauer, being the industrial mechanical engineering mind that you have. All right. The Queen Elizabeth II is a cruise liner. Moves around six feet for each gallon of fuel it burns. Fact fiction. Or fiction. Fiction. Really? Six inches. It's six inches. Did you read my sh- No, I did not. Over? Did you keep that on your computer? Because I normally look <laughs> through that ahead of time. Yeah. No, I've read that before. Isn't that staggering? Six inches on a cruise ship. Yeah. It's That's just amazing. Staggering. And yet, one of the most fuel efficient but ways to move cargo around the world is by boats. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Well, that was the thing I was going to say is some of those cruise ships are realistically you you have a small uh Midwestern town. Absolutely. Enclosed in a ship. Absolutely. I mean, the size of town we're from, that it would with the crew and everything, that wouldn't even be a big ship. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so moving all yeah. of that. You know, a gallon of fuel doesn't seem very significant. Um, in the good old days, they didn't burn fuel at all. They right. just burned crude oil. Oh, crude oil. Yeah. And that's why oh, you I see I thought you were going to old... go back to coal or wood well, when they I, had the that's steam Well, that's probably ships. true, too. But uh, like in World War II, you know, you would see you would see videos of, of boats that had black smoke coming out the top. Right. And it was literally crude oil. They would they would maybe try to make sure it got most of the water out of it because crude oil has water in it. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, and they just heat it up and spray it in there. and, and Burn. And burn, baby, burn. The cost of processing wasn't very high. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, and I suppose when you're out there on the high seas, yeah, uh, you're not a lot of pollution. You know, the neighbors aren't complaining about the smoke. Well, excuse me, during World War II, the uh, smoke coming out of a ship was probably insignificant to all the other pollution that might be going on, like sinking and burning ships and airplanes and well, that sort of thing. All that lead flying around in the air didn't help either, <laughs> I'm sure. I have heard that lead poisoning can be deadly. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. 
Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.